Good day. Thank you for joining the channel once again for another interview. Uh, I'm very excited to share a chat I had today with John Dolan. John Dolan's a New York based editorial, commercial, and wedding photographer known for creating images that celebrate joy, life, family. Some of his clients include Gwyneth Paltrow, Jerry Seinfeld, Robert Redford, and John is a hugely influential figure in the photography community has been teaching for more than 20 years at countless workshops. It was a real pleasure to catch up with him again today for this interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Recording in progress. John, super good to see you again. Super thank you uh, for joining me this morning. It's been probably about a little more than 10 years since we were in the same room. I was in New York attending the Musea Gathering. Um, a big reason I went to that gathering was to hear you and, and Holhart speak. Um, and definitely, I think though that that day did change a few ideas I had in my head about photography. Uh, wanted to thank you for that. And I also wanted to just get back into this idea you you put in my head at that time about about not joining the herd, standing right. outside of of what's happening that might be busy and popular and uh, you know, that was a that was a key insight you dropped in my head. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that might mean right now? Yeah, I think it's so funny that the wedding industry almost crushes. It sends everybody towards the middle, and it crushes or disencourages discourages people who are trying to do something new. It sends it sends the message that if you stay in this safe zone, you will be successful. And in my experience going off on my own tangent and and making my own path uh was a much uh smoother path for me uh, i think that it's it's that thing of taking risks will get you some rewards um and i the other key thing is that most photographers think that they need to please everyone out there on the internet when in fact you pick a number whether it's for me, it's 10 people a year or 20 people, that's not that many people to find. So if you're looking for a small number of really great clients, then you need to appeal to those 20 people specifically instead of pleasing everybody. Yeah. Well, what is that about that number 10? You know, I've I've seen some photographers talk about how you know, they live in LA and their clients are, you know, some of your, some people of the same stature of your clients. And they say, well, I charged Jennifer Lopez $20,000 for this wedding. I charged uh, Emilio Estevan $25,000. In a lot of communities across North America, Canada, the those clients just aren't there. There's not 10 people that are willing to spend $20,000. And I'm not asking you what you charge your clients, but what I'm asking yeah. you is, is that number... Did you come to that number based on what you could earn from every potential event? You know, I came to that number of what my body and my heart and my mind can sustain. That's really the key is you need to find that number that you can support your family, pay your mortgage, pay your rent, but also not burn out. That's that's one of the things I've watched over the years is people who rise like a rocket shoot 30 a year for five years and then they just their heads explode they just can't keep yeah. up with the pace so there's a there's a sweet spot of where you're you're able to sustain your financial and your creative uh um the flow so it's a everyone has to find that spot but uh, what I've realized is that our business is not like a normal uh, capitalist business where you want to grow, grow, grow. I think growth is really a tricky game. And if you get too many people working for you and then all of a sudden something hits, you can yeah. be in real trouble. So, you know, yeah. find your audience, find your people who appreciate you. And, uh, uh you know, I also think that money will follow the art and not the other way around. There's a lot of people I meet are so good at the marketing and the social media, but they're not feeding their artistic soul. So it's, you know, you have to, you have to treat both parts of your, your being yeah. uh, equally. 
There's some, there's something a lot to be said about that because there are certain photographers, you know, for let's, let's talk about this. For example, if I was to shoot your, your, your daughter's wedding, for example, and I broke my leg on the way there, yeah, I can't show up. So, okay. What's my style? Who's photographing the wedding? Can I call someone else to do my thing? There are photographers out there that have a, such a specific mm-hmm. look and a specific style that really there aren't many people that could call that could do that kind of thing. I feel like the kind of work that we both appreciate, the kind of work that we we want to be looking at, I feel like that's just like if you're curious, if you're talented, if you're if your timing is good, if you have a good vibe about you, yeah, you, you can walk into a room and kind of figure out similar ways of going about it. That in itself is like just feeding your own curiosity, which I think anyone with a camera that's grown up being inspired by great photographers um, would have the, have the good sense to do and not, not really get tired of that because it's an endlessly curiously, every, yeah. every event is a new thing. Every mom walks in the room with different energy and every bride is, is, is new and different. And that's infinitely exciting and, and challenging in its own way. Um, well, I, I, I see it as a, uh, we're live performers. <clears throat> so Sorry about that. <clears throat> We're live performers so that if uh, uh, I have to be on for that specific wedding, and that's the thrill of it, that, yeah. you know, it's I'm a, uh, a soccer player kicking a penalty kick or I'm a baseball player up at bat. I have to perform on that day. Weddings are fascinating because it's the same script every wedding. We know what's going to happen. So how do you make each wedding unique and and how do you not get bored how do you not get burned out um, yeah. but i think you're absolutely right when you have that sort of uh, novelist mind or you see that this interaction between these two parents and this new set of parents is complicated that's the juicy stuff and that's the uh i mean i i anytime i've gone to a wedding as a guest it's just painful but when i go as a photographer i'm so keyed into all of the drama and uh, stress and uh, so I, I, I that's really what's kept me going for 30 plus years is the individual stories how am i going to figure these people out and how they're going to let me in yeah i think that's a you know this year has been an interesting year because i think a lot of wedding photographers during covid you know they had wide open schedules and it was rough now that all those restrictions have been lifted it's been a tidal wave like every photographer i know is just like wow dude like i'm still shooting until almost december Mm. one of the questions i do speak with couples when it comes to you know listening about the schedule is like hey are there anything is there anything i should know about family time is there anything i should know is there any dramas i should watch out for i don't want to create unnecessary tension and it's that's always a kind of a funny question to ask because um usually there's no drama at all but when there is everyone sort of takes a step and says oh actually uh me and there's a little conversation back and forth about oh is he cool is she happening you know do you work things out and you know what as as touchy as that is it is an interesting thing when you show up and you know that there are some interesting things I always, I don't know, maybe I'm just a stupid optimist, but I always try to bridge and make things, yeah. make things happy for people. Well, I think that, um, I think couples appreciate the fact that you're interested in that story. And I think it's a great conversation to have. And I think the older I've gotten, the more I see that parents do come together, even if they're divorced or split up, they come together and let go of their own issues for their children, which can be a really healing uh, part of the yeah. wedding weekend. Um, so I think it's I, I think it's all human. It's all complicated. We don't have that many times to celebrate together, and weddings are this moment where everything comes together at once, and it's mm. a heightened reality. And I mean, that's why I'm so keen on remaining neutral. Uh, I, I always think of myself as Switzerland that, you know, I'm not on either side and I'm just trying to calm everybody's 
ner- or, or at least not add stress to the wedding. That's really my main uh, yeah. ethos is I will not cause stress by making you do something you don't want to do or yeah. taking up too much time, portraits and things. Well, speaking about stress, a lot of couples that I speak with, you know, they'll call me or they'll send me a, a, a request about a wedding and and I'll try to speak with them as quickly as possible. And they usually, you know, almost always say that we love this sort of effortless, fun, beautiful, like loose, candid. And I'm, and then they say, well, we're, we're really awkward people. Like yes. there's no way in hell we're going to look that good. How does this work? And, you know, in, in your shoes, you know, how do you go about, you know, working with couples that don't want to turn their wedding day into a big photo shoot, but they really have just hired John Flip and Dolan to show up and photograph their wedding. How do you go about working with couples that are a little, a little anxious or a little less quick to jump in front of the camera? Yeah, this is, this is definitely the key question. Um, And I think it's made heightened by the fact that everyone is seeing other photographers work constantly and then you get to a wedding, you have an awkward couple, and you think, how am I going to get from awkward to gorgeous? I think pushing it is exactly the wrong thing you can do. So you know, the first thing I tell people is that I have no expectations of them being models. I want to take the pressure off them. And then I uh, I look at what's their, what's their connection, what's their... I mean, I time my portraits really carefully and really fast. So I do a series of three, five minute portraits or 10 minute portraits rather than an hour. Um, I've learned to be really fast so that I'm catching them when they are feeling that connection between each other and I'm grabbing that. And then I'm saying, we got it, go. And yeah. that the in and out thing, once you, if you do that quickly at the beginning, people are grateful and then if you come up to them when the sun's going down and they're inside the tent, say, let's go out for five minutes, they trust you. Yeah. I wonder if I got that from you, to be honest with you, because I, you know, sometimes wedding planners will say, okay, Michael, let's, let's figure it out. And I'm like, I don't need a full hour right. after the ceremony because most of the time my couples really don't want to, they don't want to be away from their guests for an hour. Well, I mean, if you do the math, you have a, a wedding's really eight hours, maybe 10 hours. So if you give an hour, an eighth of your wedding for what? It's going to be one photograph, two photographs. It's it's not a good return. So yeah. um I I I think that's that's where a good photographer is letting go of their ego and saying, this is more about you than about me. And mm-hmm. you know, I had this phrase going through my head a while ago saying the wedding is not about the pictures, the pictures are about the wedding. Yeah, and once you absolutely. once you let go of that uh, a preconceived notion of, you know, I'm going to make these incredible pictures, get these pictures published and get more work. Uh, it's a freeing thing to just say, I'm here. These are two fragile people who are awkward. And yeah. um, I mean, I've often had the thing where the bride gets a little frustrated because the groom is not, you know, performing in front of the camera. And I just say to her, it's like, there's some reason you love this guy. He may be a computer geek, but, you know, (laughs) like, don't, don't push him to be something he's not. It doesn't matter to me. I can make my pictures and, um, and, and just, it's taking pressure off people rather than having a list of prompts you want to do. And, you know, I really think the whole directing thing got out of control and people are telling people have smushed their faces together or smell each other's hair or whatever it is. It's just, uh, it's just not me. It's, it's, yeah, there's other ways to do it. Well, I think some photographers, I mean, there, you know, probably as well as I did probably in the mid two thousands, there was an absolute tidal wave of people that were working in offices that said, Holy shit, I can just go get a $3,000 camera. I'm going to photograph weddings on the weekend. I'm going to make an extra $30,000, $40,000 a year. I have eight or 10 great images. I can have a website now that look professional. Right. right. And now, you know, without having those sort of people skills and being patient and being able to, 
um, have confidence in yourself as a photographer, you, you, you sort of begin to, to do these, this, the sequence. It's like, okay, yeah. now we're going to do this and then we can do this pose and then we can do this because your head's that way. And it's, it works for people, you know, it doesn't work for, it doesn't work for me, but it does work to make yeah. those people's lives easier. But at the end of the day, the kind of quality, the kind of work, the kind of emotions you're capturing, they're not the kind of emotions that you would probably want to share on your website as your work that you're proud of. You know, it is work and you did get paid for it. And the client, that client might be happy, but yeah. I feel like for a lot of other people that would not, that would not please John Dolan. Well, I think what's uh, one thing I've been thinking lately is <clears throat> So many photographers rushed into photography that they didn't get the core curriculum that we got uh, in, in the old days. So they're retrofitting or they're re-educating themselves or they need to re-educate themselves. Um, and I've been thinking lately that, you know, if you're a photographer out there who has imposter syndrome, don't just dismiss that. Uh, send yourself to school. Send yourself to a deep dive into the history of photography, uh, do other things besides weddings, because if your gut is telling you, you, you have some weaknesses in your muscles, you got to go to the gym. Um, and I, and I, I think that, uh, people rely on the, the ease of the camera, um, put it on program and go to town. And it's just, it's not going to make you a stronger photographer, but yeah. if you, you know, if you dig deep and into the craft, it's it, it's incredibly rewarding to gain that control over things. And I was speaking at a conference a couple of weeks ago in Austria, and I asked the 300 people out there, you know, what percentage of you are self-taught in the past 10 years? And it was 90% of the people, which is incredible. Yeah. And it's great, but it's also uh, where are you getting your influences where are you learning from are you learning from the the classics or are you just learning from the pop uh, from instagram what's happening on instagram yeah you then you're just chasing you're not leading yeah yeah i, I do feel like a lot of that is is hard one you know i think you know go get divorced go uh you know go fishing for a couple out you know just life these life experiences you bring them into yeah. your photography and how you frame things and um, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the best wedding photography, uh, though, like, for example, if we talk about your work immediately, when I saw your work through Michael Howard, these were images that, that seemed new, but also referenced a lot of other things I had already seen, you know, through studying graphic design, through art history, through photography, I was seeing so many things that I was already like a huge fan of. And I thought, that's some next level stuff uh, because those photographs, you know, we're looking through the frame, you know, we have this frame mm -hmm. whenever, you know, something might be outside of that frame and breaks the frame. You, you kind of think about the, the brain sort of starts asking questions like, what is that? Who is that? Right. right. Photographs ask more questions and they just tell you what it is. That staying power is beautiful because they, it doesn't really get old and it's always asking you a question. And I think, that's that's oh. really interesting because I think that that's a um, that's a sophisticated read on photography that doesn't get talked about in the wedding world. And I've always tried to be a photographer at a wedding rather than a wedding photographer. I'm not, mm. you know, I was not I was not trained as a wedding photographer. So that um, t having pictures that raise questions that don't give you the simple answer of, of, oh, these two people love each other so much, or look at the grandmother and the, you know, that's kind of first level stuff. But when you go in as an objective observer, who's trying to make something complicated and deal with that, uh, the bittersweet or the melancholy or the layers and layers of family uh complexity yeah then you have it's it's just a much more complicated if we compare it to a meal it's a much more complicated dish you know it's for me it's always this thing of the salt and the sweet that if if my pictures are too sweet then it's kind of uh cotton candy 
Um, but I love this balance where it's a little bit, I don't know, it's just got a little bit of bite to it. And um, and when you pointed out the corners too, is interesting because I was thinking back to my college professor who always taught us to, to check your corners. And he was like, you're responsible for every inch of the frame. So, uh, you know, if you just simply compose with two people in the middle of the frame and let it all go, you're wasting all this real estate. So it's a, it's a good technique. Well, I remember, you know, Gary Winogrand one time he was doing a, a speech and someone said, Gary, dude, there's, there's too much shit in the frame. And Gary's like, look, the world's a messy place. I'm not yeah. here to clean it up. Nice. And, you know, that kind of thing stuck with me a lot. You know, uh, it stuck with me, especially at weddings, because the, the it can be a very busy thing. And if you are literally standing like a pole in the middle of the room and just look, there's people in, there's people out, there's so much motion. And it's almost hard not to have those those images that uh, have multi layers of going on and those different conversations and there's this mood and there's that mood. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And to be a wedding photographer, I think is always uh, a challenge to sort of narrow down and what am I going to show? What am I going to take the shutter? Mm. I think one comment you asked at that gathering is, is he said, you know, not as a challenge to the people there, but you kind of asked everybody, you know, what are, what are the next images you're going to take that you haven't seen before? Right. And that is, that is a difficult question to answer, to be honest with you. Well, it's interesting all these years later that uh, still so many people have stayed in the herd. And I keep looking, I'm really on the lookout for this, you know, whether next generation or just somebody who's boldly going where no one's gone before or completely trying to reinvent something that's so hard to reinvent because it's such a set script. Yeah. But I, I, I just think uh, honesty and authenticity, all those words are still an opportunity for people to come in and say, um, what can I make on Saturday night that my second shooter couldn't have shot or <laughs> I didn't do last week. I'm not repeating myself. It's just a challenge to yourself and an attitude of I'm not going to play it safe. I'm not going to uh, just try to please the mother, the bride and the bride and the wedding planner. I'm going to actually please myself and the the gra the, uh, the sense of accomplishment uh, I get when I make a new wedding photograph without changing the wedding, without stopping, pressing pause and have everybody get the way I want. It's just the greatest feeling in the world. So it's, you know, you, you get a lot of reward for pushing yourself. And yeah, um, I just think it's, there's still a lot of opportunities out there. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking a lot about that because I work, I shoot a lot of my, well, there was a time where I shot weddings with a second photographer all the time. And then I started traveling for weddings and I couldn't bring, and I started working alone and my work really did get uh, much more me. And I feel like I really started to figure things out visually at that point, because I was shooting alone at all these weddings. I was in an airplane and I had a lot of pressure and somehow, somehow that, that, that force to focus and force to really pick your, yeah. pick your, your timing really opened my eyes in terms of what I could do, what I could do, what I could, what I could bring. But I feel like, um, you know, this, this is, this is an event when we're talking about weddings, this is, this is happening one time. There's no reshoots. There's no retakes in terms of breaking new ground. You know, that takes a lot of risk. And do you, do you feel when you photograph weddings by yourself, maybe there's a hundred people, maybe there's 130 people, you know, do you, do you allow yourself time to take those, those risky things? Or are you really just trying to stay, stay in the middle of, of what's happening? Uh, so the vision in my mind when I go to weddings these days is I've done this for so many years that a lot is very internalized. So my kit is very set. My, uh, the way I approach the wedding is very set. So I now see myself as a high wire artist who's done it for a long time. So I'm climbing, when I get to the wedding, I'm climbing up to the high wire. And then when the wedding starts, 
I'm going across that high wire and there's no net. So I'm you're free uh, climbing. The adrenaline is flowing and I don't want to just do the same tricks that I've done before. And I know that my balance is good, so I'm not going to fall. But uh, I think people see what I do as risky, but it's for me, playing it safe is really the riskiest thing because then I would just deliver something. I mean, if I delivered a mediocre wedding, I would be devastated. So I have to keep going higher and doing more tricks and juggling on the on the high wire. And um, otherwise, it, what's the point? I think the whole, and I'm also trying to flip it on its head where people think, how can you take risk at somebody's wedding? And I ask myself, how can I not? How can I come home and just say, you know, I I just <clears throat> dialed it in, just did a couple, just did the normal things, had them put their cheeks together and, you know, so, so I, you know, I take that all, all the way through. I talk to people, I sit down and we'll talk to the father, the bride and have a glass of wine. And I'm really, like you said, when you go by yourself, you are, there's nobody to talk to except for the guests. So you're not hanging out with your second shooter and looking about your next wedding. It's very in the moment yeah. moment. That's one of the questions that one, uh, one of the photographers on my group was asking about was specifically about, uh, well, it's not specifically about, but this works into your, into your, your last statement about being on a high wire and it's more risky to not take risks than to take risks. But the question they have is more about how can I be sure I'm ready to fly? You know, if I've never flown before in that way to really step out of my comfort zone and say, I'm going to take this couple down by the swamp over here. It's in the middle of a cocktail or in the middle of the evening, you get a little wind in the jacket, you know, you just air out and let's just see what happens for the next five minutes. Um, they yeah. want to know really how can how can they be more confident to know that when they come back, they're going to have something special. I, I think the, the best thing I've come up with for that is to find a friend or a friend of a friend and offer to do the wedding for free or for cost. So you they have and and agree with them that you can do whatever you want. So yeah. if you find somebody, you know, I'm thinking like if it's a nurse or a somebody who deserves a free wedding or something and just say, here's the deal. I'm trying to reinvent myself, trying to clear my brain of all these cliches. Can I just come and do it for free? Um, I have a big family, so I have a lot of nieces and nephews getting married. And I did one two weeks ago and it was, you know, it was just, I mean, it was just so freeing. And I brought the eight by 10 camera and I brought, I just did everything I wanted because I knew that they'd be happy with one picture or five pictures. So when you do one of those, you're doing it totally for yourself and you, you need to retrain your behavior patterns. So you don't just go back to the easy stuff. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I always have this kind of thing where someone will ask me like the father will, or someone will say, Hey, great job. You're doing great today. I'm like, how do you know I'm doing great exactly. today? You haven't seen any of the image. I have garbage, you know? And you know, I'll always say, oh, I've got, but they know you're perform. They're no, they know you're moving well and you're part of the party. That's what they're saying. Yeah. And they'll say, you must have a million great photos. And I'm usually say, oh, I've got at least eight to 10 good ones. And they'll look at me like I'm crazy. But then I'm like, you know, really, how many images do you, do you, how many images do you, are you going to look at? How many images are you going to actually yeah. keep as your family heirlooms, you know? And they're kind of like, yeah, you're kind of right. I mean, eight to 10. Yeah, that's probably about it. <laughs> And it's crazy, all the pressure photographers feel sometimes and all the, I mean, I just bought uh, a new memory card and I couldn't get one for less than like 250 gigabytes. Right. I thought like that is an insane amount of space, right. like right. insane. Right. And I mean, if I shoot more than a thousand photos, di even digitally, I feel like I'm overwhelmed. I've got like way too much to deal with. I would never deliver uh, a couple like seven, more than 700 images because it's just so many images. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's almost like an obscene amount of food, you know, just like give them a plate with yeah. a beautiful Nouvelle cuisine plate full of photographs is a great concept. It's we're all flooded with pictures and um, 
it's there's no doubt that we need to, to do quality over quantity that with all the people with phones at the wedding doing their pictures and um i feel that helps me to be feel free to just make something that nobody else could have made on that day and yeah. uh and and that's really the key if you're just clicking the shutter to to as a kind of insurance policy um that's a mistake and i think a lot of photographers dread that one email that they might get once in their life from a bride saying you didn't get a picture of uncle fred and yeah he was really important to me well maybe he was not much fun because if he was fun i'd have a picture of him <laughs> you know it's it did it, i got uh, that i got that yeah. You know, We've all gotten that one email, and it, but it it can't make you come down off the high wire act and just yeah. play it I safe. Think there, there's also a girl, Annabelle. She's in my group, and she shoots a lot with her rolly flex at weddings. And uh, you know, I encourage her to just, just shoot more. Like bring, you know, you know, you have a problem with twelve shots, bring two twenty film and shoot sixteen shots or whatever, because those sort of unexpected. Like there's a thing about film where there's always a little bit of surprise and there's always yeah. an unexpected thing. Maybe you miss the focus. Maybe you drag the shutter a little too much, but those kind of things are really, you can't duplicate those kind of things because they're always different. Every, every mistake yeah. is an opportunity for something beautiful. And I think just even just thinking the film, just going back to shooting more film for her would like significantly increase that 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 percentage of like wow moments for for that wedding when I shot seven rolls of film instead of three you've got twice as much more than twice as much moments to potentially be like wow here it is yeah what is your yeah. what what do you what do you shoot with easy what is your 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 setup most of the time you know I was so uh resistant to digital for years and years um then Leica came out with uh, the M240, which is my first digital, and I really loved that. Mm. Um, and now I have the M10. Um, so I use that for uh, for bad lighting because it's really the worse the lighting, the better digital is for me. And <laughs> and inversely, yeah. with great light film is is so untouchable. So I do both. So I, I do a hybrid version now and. I'm really happy with that. I don't think people can tell too easily my digital from my film, um, but I still shoot the Rolleiflex and uh, other weird cameras. I like to bring something special to every wedding and yeah. uh, keeps me a little bit loose to use a new camera. Um, I have a big closet full of cameras. Yeah, don't don't we all? I'm sure you're <laughs> bigger than anyone else's though. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I think one of the one of the other questions, one of speaking about being spontaneous and being quick and being curious and never putting the camera down for long is, you know, some people will look at your work and say, ah, oh, he's in New York. I mean, there's plenty of crazies and weirdos and very interesting people like that there because all the directors are in New York, all the all of these people are in New York. You know, I don't get that in Cincinnati. I don't get that in uh, Tulsa you know, where am I going to find these people? Like the weirdest person I'm going to find might be wearing a baseball hat at the wedding. Right. I say, great, hang out with, have a beer with the guy in the baseball hat, you know? And yeah. is it possible, is it possible to, you know, subject matter aside, is it possible for someone who is living in a city that might not be as, as uh, cosmopolitan with such a rich, vibrant population to still sort of find those images that surprise them. Um, one of the questions that came in was about, you know, you know, working in a small town, working in, a, in an area where it's very one note, very, for, for example, very Quebecois, it's all, you know, French speaking, this type of people, maybe there's not a lot of variety and they really are ready to explore those areas, but they're just not getting the same visual, uh, the, the, those interesting moments. Do you think that there's, there's always a way to sort of come out with surprising images that really touch those personalities and explore those personalities? I, I do. And I think that sometimes we play down to our audience and think that people aren't ready for what they're really ready for. And I think if the pictures are 
honest and reflective of what that community is like, then they'll resonate. But I also think this is that narrow casting rather than broadcasting. So yeah. if you're in Cincinnati, I guarantee you there's one cool coffee shop. And in that coffee shop, there's two cool 28 year olds who are getting engaged and they're looking for a cool photographer. They're not at the TGI Fridays yeah. or, you know, so it's, it's really, you know, we played this game at, uh, I play this game at my workshops where we say, if, if you were a restaurant, what restaurant would you be? Are you a chain or are you a taco truck with organic pork? And, you know, how stop trying to, to, uh, please every possible client and say message to those cool people in your community. I'm here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the person you're, you didn't know you, you needed, mm -hmm. but I'm available. And, uh, yeah. it's a, it's a whole different way of working that is showing your personality and, um, it is hard because photographers by nature, I think, are pleasers, people pleasers. So you have to be a little bold and unique and uh, yeah, show a little attitude. I mean, there was a wedding I was photographing one time in uh, Scotia, Scotia, New York. Yep. And there was a guy and he was by no means uh, like someone you'd walk up to right away. You know, he's probably in his mid 50s, just having a beer. We started talking about fishing and trucks and this guy lit up and became mm -hmm. the guy you'd go to right away. Right. Because he just sort of woke up and just became interested and, be, and started talking with me and telling me stories. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, I, I thought about like the, this, this idea of like walking in a room and trying to find the most interesting person Sometimes just being just just being a real human being and starting a conversation yeah. just awakens these personalities and then they become like super interesting. You want to take three rolls of film of this person. But that's your maturity talking too. I think uh, what percentage of the photographers listen to this stop and actually have those human conversations as opposed to look at the shot list and I have to take this, I have to take this. Okay, can you stand there? You got to take a picture, check. Yeah. So I think it that that exudes that kind of trust in yourself and confidence in that you're going to get the pictures. And um, I mean, I think it just is, it's the only way to, to uh, unlock the people who you're photographing by finding out who they are. And that's, it's the fun of it, but it's, it's not taught in the <laughs> wedding photography manual, you know, yeah. be human have real conversations with people and then maybe take their picture. This is the, this is the story with uh, one photographer I've been training my friend, Marlo. Hey, Marlo, how are you ready? Marlo is my second shooter. Whenever I need a second shooter, he doesn't know how to use a camera and people would say, what you're bringing a second shooter who has zero photograph. I'm like, yeah, he knows shit about photography. Yeah. But this guy honestly will bring home, like stuff that would make uh, anyone sh like laugh out loud because he has this personality and I don't, you know, it, it's just him. Yeah. He takes, I've given him some instructions. You're not allowed to manual focus, autofocus. Everything's black and white square and just show up and be there. And he brings home the wackiest, most like honest, beautiful portraits of ev every stranger at the wedding just because he doesn't know he's incredibly ignorant to the whole wedding photography setup. And yeah. I say, please don't ever get better. Just stay right. a total amateur. Right. Don't try to be that guy. Just be you. And cause you're, he's, you know, he does amazing stuff, but other photographers think it's crazy. And I say, honestly, you need to hire him because your portfolio, you will honestly be <laughs> laughing on the floor for hours, but you'll also be like, why didn't I think of that? Amazing. Well, do you remember uh, the White Stripes? Yeah. Jack White. Yeah. The dr the drummer Meg Meg was not she didn't know how to drum, but she just went up there and just banged yeah. and the rawness of it and the intensity and the pure 
just joy that she push. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think you're right. I think we're all uh, focused on getting, uh, making sure we got the shot and we uh, it's just such a false sense of uh, accomplishment or, or success mm-hmm. and uh, success is for me it's this thing of unexpected and honest and truthful imagery that is going to resonate in 30 years it's, so how do you make that picture yeah I have a question though because you uh, I, I know that you know weddings for you you entered this with a personal promise not to get uh, sucked into the world of wedding photography, where your schedule, you still had time for, for your for your family, you still had time for your editorial clients and commercial clients. And I think that when you're really doing it right, there's really not a lot of difference visually from your wedding work to your editorial work to your commercial work. Do you, do you approach those jobs in a very similar way? Because they look like completely smooth in terms of aesthetics and mood and this sort of visual re- like like references they all have the same tonality and it's it's a it's beautiful well i i think that i learned uh early on that i have a particular way of working which is uh to not overly prepare and overly direct and then it what i realized is you know weddings are giving this amazing training to all these photographers. Weddings gave me incredible training to deal with finding light quickly, to deal with complex emotions, to deal with chaos. And that helped my editorial. My editorial helped my advertising work. Um, So it's kind of a a beautiful uh, system of sharing and uh, inspiring. But um, I think there's a huge amount of talent out there in the wedding industry. These people who are shooting 30 a year. They're getting experience up the wazoo. Uh, I always encourage photographers to shoot other things besides weddings, whether it's nonprofit, go to the local yeah. foundation near you and offer your services. Cause uh, I've done that for years up here where I live in the country and it's, I can get a lot of great pictures in one day for these organizations uh, because we know how to do storytelling. We know how to turn something that's not that great into something really super, but it's, um, I, I I guess really my style is just to, I'm good at feeling what a situation uh, needs and how to turn that office photograph into something that feels tangibly, um, uh, where you can really tell what that place is like. Yeah. So that was always my thing. What's something feel like rather than what it looks like. Those are great words to, to live by John, for sure. Um, hey, you know what? Uh, it's been awesome speaking with you. Super good to, to connect with you again, to hear about your process. Uh, I'm definitely going to mention, uh, you know, good things about the, uh, the, the perfect imperfect, your book, which is, uh, which is a crazy collection of images that uh, should be on the table of every wedding photographer. Um, thank you very much for taking some time today. It's been great to chat with you. And, Michael, I'm uh, glad you reached out. It's great to reconnect. And uh, uh, these questions were fantastic. And it's, I mean, I think it's an exciting time. So I, I hope people don't get burned out from last year and choose carefully what weddings deserve you for 23. And don't overbook the the weddings will come have faith in yourself and be distinctive and uh fly high fly high let's do it thanks <laughs> <laughs> okay bud thanks so much john i'm gonna press uh i'm gonna press stop right now